to our multi-part series for Inventor Back to Basics. Today we're going to be continuing on looking at some of the best practices and basic functionality within the assembly environment. Looking at some of the basics for the Inventor assembly environment, one area that always comes up in new user training and in support cases is the content center and a lot of users get confused on what the content center actually is. It's actually two pieces of files. So if you look in your project file, there is a section in the properties of the project file down here at the bottom under folder options. If you expand that you'll see content center files. It lists a path for the content center files. And a lot of people want to think this is the location of the databases. That's not what this is. This is something after the databases. So where the databases are is controlled by or mapped by your application options. So if you load your application options on the content center tab you will notice a section to specify a path if you're dealing with a non-vault set of content center files. If they're in vault that's in a completely different uh, setup and workflow. But if they are not inside a vault then you're dealing with the inventor desktop content and it points out a path. That path is the location of the source databases. So we're actually going to look at both of these simultaneously on the screen. So what you're seeing as I clear it up in the top half window you're seeing the location of the actual databases themselves. This is what is called out in the application options. These are the source databases or source tables that's going to generate the actual content center component. In the bottom half you're looking at the destination location when a content center file is generated or when you pull something from the content center it reads the table information from the database and reads all of the sizes and sketches and features that's needed to create that component and then it creates that component and saves it in this path. This path is what is specified in the project file. So down here in the bottom under folder options this is the destination path where the content center files will be saved once they are placed or pulled from the database. Continuing on with the database and the content center workflow, you're going to be placing some parts from the content center. And one thing that can really help boost production and cut down your lead times and kind of streamline your workflow is to use the component generator. So inside the assembly environment, there is a design tab. Various generators exist on this tab, and one of those is bolted connection. This is going to cover the most amount of users because not everyone needs any kind of frame generator capability or shaft capability or gearing capability, but just about everybody is going to work with bolts and nuts at some point. So the way the generator works, when you launch the bolted connection generator, some key features that you have to specify are the start plane. This is going to be where the connection starts or the underside of the bolt head. So you pick a start plane then you can choose various options to place the actual bolt either by a linear location concentric on point or by hole. When you place it by hole you're looking for an actual hole feature that was modeled in the piece part. So you specify that and then you specify the termination location or the stop plane where this bolted connection is going to end. So this is going to be where the nut or the fastener actually rests. Now the way this is set up to function you can choose to follow the pattern and it will if the holes were generated as part of a pattern feature it will follow every one of those so you don't have to go through here and count and possibly get your count wrong. The nice thing about this generator though is once you build a connection once you come in here and you add a fastener it pulls into the content center you're looking at all the different fasteners you can pick from all of the different bolts either by standard or whatever component shape you might be looking for hex head flat head whatever once you build that connection in here you can save it down at the bottom you can add it as a favorite and you can call upon that at any time so when you have that saved whether it be in this assembly or in other assemblies this favorites list is associated to your project file not the assembly. 
So when I have this saved as a favorite, all I have to do is reference it in my favorites list, set that as my configuration. You see in the preview, it automatically highlights and shows me the preview of all of the ones it's going to place. When I click OK, it's going to generate a bolted connection subassembly, and within a few seconds, it pulls those pieces from the content center databases as specified in your application options, generates the components, and saves them in the content center files path as specified in your project file. So looking over here in the component pattern, I have my bolted connection, my bolt, my washers, and my fastening nut. Another item with the back to basics is looking at your different representations that exist within an assembly file. So over in the assembly browser tree, there is a representations folder. When you expand that folder, you will see three flag items. You have a view colon master, you have a position, and you have a level of detail colon master. The main two to focus on here are the view reps, which is the top one view colon master, and the levels of detail. These are very, very similar in what they visually give you, but they differ in what they functionally give you. So in the view rep, you can specify multiple reps, and the purpose of a view rep is to give you the ability to turn on and turn off the visibility of components. So you can display as different materials or as core components or as internal components. You can just right click on the component, turn off its visibility, and that's associated with that view rep. You can also set different materials, different view angles, and different appearances. Think of the appearances as though you're applying a paint job to some of the components. So if I wanted to bring that housing back into the mix, but yet I wanted to take that piece and change it from a chrome finish to maybe a painted or a copper colored finish. It's almost like applying a paint job, so you get a good color scheme associated with it. With a level of detail, it's similar in the workflow. You specify a new view rep or you specify a new level of detail, but the difference with levels of detail is you're not turning off the visibility of the component, you're actually suppressing the component. So when you generate that new level of detail, you right click on the component and you suppress it. What this actually does is it unloads it from memory. With visibility, it unloads it from graphical memory, but it's still in the main system memory of the application and of Windows. So it's still con consuming some resources. With levels of detail, it unloads the majority of that component's footprint from memory. You're still getting some basic information. Okay, It still appears in the assembly bill of material. That does not change. Neither the view rep nor the level of detail will remove a component from the bill of material. The other thing that suppressing it and using a level of detail does is it shows an overall bounding box. So basically a footprint to represent the location and overall size of the component. This allows you to model around it with some reasonable acceptable tolerances to get around that component. Both of these can be utilized in drawing views or in presentation views. Another item to look at in the assembly environment are contact sets. What contact sets allow you to do is to see contact between two components and this is incredibly advantageous when you have components that are moving and you want to see the movement of one component drive the position or location or function of another component or even a subassembly. There's a two-step process to get this to work. By default, the contact solver is turned on with a brand new install of Inventor. That solver is turned on and off on the inspect ribbon. You'll see that the activate contact solver is turned blue in my Windows 10, so that lets me know it's turned on. In order for this to work, you have to have the contacting parts, not just one, but both or all of them involved in the contact, they have to be in the contact set. So in this situation, what I actually have to do is suppress this angle constraint that's holding this driving piece here and I can spin it. And when I do that, you see it passes through the other gear mechanism. In order for this spin to drive the gear mechanism, what's actually going to contact it here is this small little chrome bushing. 
So I'll right click on that and I'll add that to the contact set on the right click menu. That's half of the process because I have to add the gearing mechanism into that contact set as well. You'll notice the icon of the chrome bushing changed. You see a small icon added to it. It looks like two magnets or two plates hitting each other. You need the same function assigned to the gearing component. So when I right click on that and add that to the contact set, now when I drag and spin that one mechanism, when they come into contact with each other, it actually pushes the gearing component and indexes it around as it should.